Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Tara Kieran. I'm a family doctor and also the vice chair for quality and innovation in our Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. And I'm so delighted that our department can continue to bring you these um, sessions together with the Ontario College of Family Physicians. And I'm going to turn it over to their President Mahale to introduce the session. Mahale? Mahale, you're on mute, sorry. Thank you, Tara. I had to do that once this year. Um, morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, great to be here, and uh, I'm super excited for our last session of 2023. Um, before we dive in, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our speakers for today. And uh, just a reminder, this is a main pro accredited session and uh, details will follow by email. Next slide. So I'll just move on to our land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The OCFP and DFCM recognize that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. Allison, are you able to mute yourself? Um, thank you. Go ahead again, Mahale. Thank you. Uh, the OCFP and DFCM respect that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite us all to reflect on the territories we are calling in from as we commit to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship, and contributing to reconciliation. And I'm calling in from Kitchener, the lands traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Chinantan peoples. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to to reflect on injustices past and present. Um, as part of uh, the Our Care initiative, we've been having roundtables with uh, um, marginalized communities across the country. And a recent roundtable we had was with Indigenous youth in Manitoba. Um, something that was said very early on in the roundtable there really stuck with me, that the youth there say they go to the emergency department expecting to be discriminated against. That line to me was so powerful and particularly powerful because I know that so many of them also didn't have a family doctor. So they had nowhere to turn other than the emergency department when things were bad. Yet at the same time, they really didn't want to go there because they knew that it was a place that was unsafe for them. And so just a reminder that racism and discrimination continues in healthcare today and that it's all of our obligations to do better to address that. I'm gonna go to our next slide. And uh, just remind folks that these are part of a series of sessions. And so you can look at our past sessions and you'll look at today's recording at our website. I wanna take a moment because it's the last session of the year to just thank our wonderful planning committee. You can see their names on the slide. Um, we meet you know, every two weeks to really talk about what it is that we should be bringing you at this session. And uh, so many of them also are doing things on the back end to make sure that these sessions happen and are successful. So huge shout out to them. I also wanted to introduce someone new today who's gonna to be co-moderating with me both today and in the new year and then take over as a moderator um, on a move forward basis uh, along with our other moderator, Ali Damji. And, uh, and, and so that person is Eleanor College. So Dr. Eleanor College, uh, she's a family physician uh, in Toronto uh, and she is also now the CPD program director in our department. So Eleanor, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to moderate the first half of the session. Thanks, Tara, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, excited, next slide, please, uh, to welcome our, our great series of panelists today, and I'm just going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Allison McGeer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here, as always. Um, you can see my conflicts, as you know, I have a lot of research relationships with companies that make vaccines and, uh, and antivirals that are here. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Allison. Now to Maggie Karastechi. Hi there. Thank you so much uh, for letting me speak to you for a few minutes today. 
Um, I come to you as a patient and a caregiver. I also come to you as an advocate for the co-design of a person-centered healthcare system that's built on primary care. Um, I've worked in healthcare my entire career, but I have learned far more about the delivery of care in my role as patient and caregiver um, than all the time working in healthcare. So again, I thank you for allowing me to spend a few minutes with you today, and I have no conflict. Great, a pleasure to have you. And uh, Jonathan Eisenberg? Hi there, I'm Jonathan Eisenberg. I'm a family physician in South Etobicoke Atlantic Community Health Center. I'm also the provincial primary care lead cancer screening at Ontario Health. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Jonathan. And now to Dr. Anna Carelli. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm the uh, uh, senior scientist at Ontario Health. And I'm the scientific lead for the Ontario Breast Screening Program, and I have uh, no conflicts of interest to declare. Thank you. And now to Dr. Mahale Kumana. Hi there. Um, my name is Mahale. I'm a family doc in Cambridge. I'm currently the president of the OCFP, and I also serve as a chief of family medicine at um, the Cambridge Memorial Hospital, uh, neither of which poses a conflict for today. And uh, Terry introduced me, but uh, just to remind you, I'm Eleanor College. I'm a family physician. I work in East Toronto, and uh, I don't have any conflicts today. And I'll turn things to Tara. Hi, um, I'm Tara, uh, and you can see my uh, disclosures there on the slide. I don't think any of them pose a conflict for today. Great. So just a reminder, we really welcome your questions. Uh, please pop them in the Q&A and uh, ensure that if you see a question that somebody else has already asked that you think would be a great one, um, give it an upvote because we prioritize those when we, we speak with the speaker. Uh, also, we really welcome you continuing to share your resources, your comments, your reactions in the chat. Uh, we know this is a lovely spot to network with colleagues. Um, so uh, feel free to, to keep commenting in there and then just keep your questions to the Q&A. Next slide. Uh, and we'll now turn things over um, to get started. Alison. Thanks very much, Tara. Okay, I, I thought last week there was nothing to talk about, but now I have too many slides. So I'm gonna apologize for trying to go quickly about a, a number of small things. So let's start with Novavax. You probably all know that Novavax is now authorized in Canada. It's about uh, a week old. It's taken about a week to get into the country and get it distributed to provinces, it's going out to health units and should be there next week. The health units are in charge of distribution to the rest of us. Uh, so if you haven't heard from your health unit about accessing it next week, fine to get in touch with them. Um, the only complication with this is that although the five and 10 dose vials are stable when they're unopened, they're only stable for six hours after the vial is open. So try not to waste uh, vaccine is going to be a little bit challenging, but at least it's available for um, people who are unwilling or unable to get mRNA vaccines. Next slide. Okay, so what's coming? Well, you know, it's December the 15th and we are where we usually are with flu and RSV. You can see on the right-hand side, the yellow is just number of tests done, which go up, of course, in the winter season. And the black lines are test positivity. So um, RSV is doing what you expect RSV to do in the winter. And uh, H1, the influenza season has officially started in Ontario as of last week. That happens when you cross 5% positivity. Um, predictably, it's now going to peak probably second week of uh, January. Lots of activity over the holidays. Good news, bad news, it's H1N1, which means that it will differentially be less severe in older adults, not there won't be hospitalizations, won't be as bad as an H3N2 season, but lots of kids being ill and lots of pressure on emergency departments and um, family practices. And the left-hand side, you see the bad news about COVID that we've already heard from Dr. Moore and others about, um, which is that our wastewater signal in Ontario is now higher than it has ever been, okay? So a lot of COVID out there. And the good news is, that we're tolerating a lot of COVID without, you know, a catastrophe. But the bad news is on the next slide. Okay. Uh, which is that hospitalizations are back up. Not as high 
um, as they were for you know comparable wastewater activity, um, but still significant numbers of hospitalizations. And next slide. Uh, here's the COVID-19 deaths. Um, the, 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 the lower rates that appear to be in the last two week period uh, for both hospitalization deaths are probably not real. There's just a lag time in reporting. So the, the, the last numbers are not reliable and almost certainly we're continuing to climb. So just in trying to place it, uh, we've it be, between September and the end of November in Ontario, we've had 532 deaths from COVID. That's about the same number of people as die in a year from car accidents. Um, so it, it's not a huge number, but it is a really a, you know, it's a significant number and it's a number we need to be thinking about preventing. And the thinking about preventing is particularly important uh, because of the vaccination data, which is on the next slide. Um, so these are in Ontario as of December the 2nd, 2023, and you can see that in older adults, we're about 42% of people above 70 who've received an XBB um, 1.5 vaccine this fall. Now, that looks a little worse than it is because you've got to remember that quite a lot of people have had COVID this fall, and we don't have good data on what proportion of people that is, but it's probably at least 10% and maybe higher. So that puts us at about 50% of older adults who've had uh, a, a COVID shot this fall, um, which is a little disappointing. Normally we get to 70 or 75% of older adults getting their flu shot. That's where I was hoping to be with COVID vaccines, which really tells you that anything we can do to get COVID vaccines into our older adults um, in the next two weeks um, is gonna be helpful in terms of protecting them. Um, and of keeping pressure off the healthcare system. Um, so it is, and you know, truthfully, this is a really good time to get your flu and COVID shots because we're going into peak activity in three or four weeks. Next slide. Okay, so this is my line to people on, on what you need to think about in protecting yourself for the holidays. You start with yourself, okay, which is, you know, easiest and best thing you can do is get vaccinated against influenza and COVID. But then you need to make your own decisions about how much you care about doing other things versus seeing people and and um, getting in touch with people over the holidays. You just need to think about avoiding crowded spaces, not having contact with symptomatic people, when you're going to choose to wear a mask or respirator. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about having rapid tests available. And if you're eligible for Paxlovid, having a treatment plan for getting treatment for COVID-19 over the holidays if it happens. And then you need to do a bit of extra thinking about protecting the vulnerable people who live around you, which is about you know staying home when you're sick. It's about maybe if we're healthcare providers having rapid tests available that we can share with people who need them. Um, and it's about thinking about how you arrange visits and activities over the holiday so that you protect them. And then finally, it's about being respectful of the fact that we're all in different places about what we want in prevention of COVID with non-pharmaceutical interventions. And it's about understanding that all of our anxieties and, and priorities are different um, and trying to get through the season that way. Next slide. Okay, so three things about rats because some months ago, I think there was a lot of discussion about not use, just staying home when you were sick and not using rats because a negative rat test, even two negative rat tests does not guarantee you don't have COVID. But things have changed now, partly in how we're thinking about things and partly in the fact there's a, a lot of other respiratory viruses out there. So now we wanna be using COVID tests to know whether you have COVID. And that's mostly about if you're eligible for Paxlovid and you have COVID, we wanna get you on treatment. But it's also, I think, about if you know you have COVID, it's much easier to give up, you know, the big family parties or the other things where you might go and infect other people. So this is just a reminder, first of all, that rats are not perfect, but they're better than nothing. They're better than nothing for two reasons. So this slide is a recent paper from Michelle Science and Aaron Capogato at um, uh, the Hospital for Sick Children, just looking in children at the proportion who were rat positive in the first three days of illness. And you can see that although it's clearly not everybody, it's 75% of people. 
So picking up 75% of cases is clearly better than nothing. Second slide. The other reason you need to do test is this, I'm sorry, a beautiful but unnecessarily complicated slide, um, which is to point out that when you look at an individual patient with a respiratory illness, you can't tell what they have without a lab test, okay? There are statistical differences. So if you look here, in the red is the proportion of people with Omicron infections who have a fever, which is down at 20%. In contrast, if you have influenza, according to their data, not what most people report, but this is the British um, uh, flu watch system, 80% of people have a fever. So if you have 100 people, and they all have one disease or the other, you can distinguish what they have. But if you have one person, you can't tell whether they have COVID or flu. There's just no possibility. So that's the other reason for COVID tests because when people get sick now, lots of people will have flu or RSV or other things. Um, and you wanna be able to pick out the people with COVID partly because prevention is more important with COVID, but also so that you can get people on treatment. Next slide. Okay, second thing about rats is remember that rats are um, in, of increased sensitivity when you don't just do a nasal swab, you do a swab of the back of the tongue or the throat. And this is another new paper from JAMA Network open on those blue arrows to show you the increase in self-administered swab from 58 to 73 um, and in, in nurse administered swabs from 58 to 79. Is, they used throat swabs as our second specimens as opposed to back of tongue swabs. And this is the demonstration that you can't do your own throat swab as well as a healthcare provider can. That is a true fact, okay? But if you're using back of tongue or side, it, it works almost as well. So when people are doing rapid tests, it's good to have them add um, the tongue swab. And the third thing about rapid tests, next slide, is about expiry dates. Um, it is not uncommon uh, in on medications and tests to extend expiry dates. There's nothing surprising about it. It's just been a little bit hard, uh, I think, to track data. So for rapid response in Abbott Pond Bio, SC Biosensor, the expiry dates are all two years after manufacturing, and the boxes all tell you when they were manufactured. For Artron, they don't tell you when it was manufactured. There's just an expiry date, and you add six months to the expiry date if you're looking at them. The reason this is important now is because, as far as I can tell, every test that is available is still okay. But come February, we're going to be starting to get into expired tests. So we're going to have to have our eyes open about whether they're going to extend the expiry dates again, which might happen, um, or whether we really will have expired tests and, um, and get out. And yes, I see David saying it would help if this information was out there. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. It's a pain in the neck trying to figure out um, uh, when these tests expire, and I would really like us to be doing better. Next slide. Okay, so a couple of small notes on other things. Um, there's much more detail in Zhang Chagla's uh, October presentation um, at this community of practice on RSV vaccines. But just to talk about where we are, um, we're after preventing RSV in two populations now, older adults, and small children, because those are the populations, those are the big populations where there's a really significant degree of disease. You bring up immunocompromised patients and you're right, but they're later because we don't yet have clinical trial data. Okay, so for older adults, we have one authorized vaccine in Canada. It's a protein vaccine that's adjuvanted. There's good efficacy data from a small clinical trial. Um, there's safety data so far from the people in that trial. Good news is we're gonna have a lot of safety data from the US after this season. It's gonna be after this season. You can get it in the private market and pay for it. Um, it's still really expensive. So nothing wrong with accessing if you can get to it, but it, you know, not yet in public programs, hard to know where it's gonna go in public programs. The second group of people that we'd really like to prevent RSV in um, are infants and, and very young children. And there we're just stuck at the moment. There's two ways of preventing RSV in kids. One is to vaccinate their mums when they're pregnant. So the antibody crosses the placenta and protects the baby. And the vaccine that is available for pregnant women is not yet authorized in Canada. So you just can't get it. Uh, and the second is a new monoclonal antibody that hopefully will be it's just one shot per season as opposed to repeated ones and hopefully will be more available. It's licensed 
but it's not available. There's just not enough product. So nothing we can do this season except sit tight um, and know that better RSV prevention uh, is coming later. Next slide. Okay. And lastly, a little bit about pneumococcal vaccines. Um, the, you know, also in the midst, it, 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 you know, being in the midst of chaos about COVID vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines and flu vaccines and RSV vaccines all at the same time is really irritating. And I'm sorry for that. It, it is good news that better things are coming though. So what's going to happen with the four vaccines we have available is the first thing is the 13 valent pneumococcal vaccine is going to be gone. Okay. Pfizer makes PCV 13 and PCV 20, and they're going to replace 13 with 20. So we will be down to three. What's going to happen with PCV15, PCV20, and pneumococcal vaccine depends on what decisions the province, what decisions NASI makes about pediatric recommendations and what decisions the province makes about what we're going to choose for vaccine supply. That's a really complicated and difficult decision because we don't know for sure which is the better choice for preventing infections. Um, we all want a simple program and a PCV20 program would be simpler, but we also want to be spending our money in the best possible way, which might end up being PCV15 with uh, a second shot of the polysaccharide vaccine to get the extra um, uh, coverage. Uh, we just don't know where the province is going to land. Um, so the next slide is what I'm thinking about what to do while we're waiting. Okay, so I think there are lots of choices all of which are perfectly reasonable, but this is the way I'm thinking about it. So with kids, um, the hopefully the program changes will come within the next six to 12 months in Ontario. Um, and to me, it makes the most sense to continue PCV 13 and wait for program changes. Remember that the benefit of going to PCV 15 or 20 um, is not as great as the benefit of going from PCV 7 to PCV 13 was. So there isn't quite as much urgency to change. But if parents wish to pay for PCV15 or PCV20, it's available on the private market. Perfectly good decision. Um, and the other piece of good news is that NACI has recommended that at least for PCV15, and it'll probably come for PCV20, that you can use them interchangeably. So you can, it doesn't matter which dose you're giving which one, which is a, a you know, really useful addition. For adults, the situation is a little different because PCV20 um, and PCV15 are cost effective and better than PCV13 and clearly cost effective for older adults, for 50 to 64 year olds with comorbidity, um, for people who are immunocompromised. So my view is if you have an adult who's eligible for a conjugate vaccine by current NASI recommendations, um, if they have private insurance, get PCV20, great. If they can afford to pay for it, perfect. Otherwise, while we're waiting, PCV, PPV23 is a good vaccine. It's a useful vaccine. It protects you. And if you get your polysaccharide vaccine now, you'll still be able to get a conjugate vaccine later, right? Prevnar, the, the pneumococcal vaccines are long-term protection as opposed to short-term protection um, for this season. Um, and so there's absolutely nothing wrong with giving somebody a polysaccharide vaccine now, knowing that one to five years, depending on the situation and what NASI does, they'll be able to get a conjugate vaccine for later protection. Um, and I'm gonna stop there, hopefully to leave a little bit of time for questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Allison, for uh, sort of bringing us up to date on where we are in terms of winter viruses. I know it's always helpful in the office to have this, uh, this knowledge while you're speaking with patients about why they might not need antibiotics. Um, also great that we are, have some clarity around uh, Prevnar and uh, the new vaccines that are coming out there. Uh, there have been a number of questions come up in, in the chat, and I'm just going to start with the ones that were most common. Um, one, you were actually beginning to answer uh, typing it in, and I think you did answer this in your presentation with the infographic, but uh, people are wondering how long uh, individuals usually rapid test positive for, and uh, can it be for weeks, and are they still contagious of testing positive? Yeah, so... so there's two kinds of people who can be positive for longer periods of time. There are some people who just carry leftover RNA for long periods of time. If you're healthy, if you don't have Paxlovid rebound and you get to 10 days and you're still testing positive, we know you're not infectious. You can stop worrying at 10 days, even if you test positive. 
Um, the, the hard part about testing positive is in that period between five and 10 days. Most people begin to test negative somewhere between day five and day eight. Um, and the problem is that some of those people, although they're a minority, some of those people are still infectious, less infectious than they would otherwise have been, but still infectious. So these are the, this is the place where it's really hard to decide what to do with them. It's obviously better if people in that situation can stay home, but there may be circumstances in which, remember that masks work well for source control, okay? So outward direction virus, reasonably well stopped by um, masks. You don't need the respirators as much. And so masking in the situation where you think somebody might be infectious, but they're probably not very infectious, not an unreasonable approach some of the time um, in some circumstances. Thanks, Allison. I think actually just in follow up to that, um, there was a question regarding um, at some family doctor clinics, they're saying that staff that are testing positive for rat, like we're still rat positive, but their symptoms of result can come back to work with an N95 mask. Um, and just wondering if this is safe for others to work with them. So, you know, here, here we're into this really difficult decision about you know, what our guidance is, because remember that public health guidance doesn't necessarily say that you have to test, that you have to do testing and you have to wait till you're negative, right? Public health guidance says, if you're ill, you stay home until your symptoms are resolved. And so the, the, and, and so if you don't do rat, so now if I get symptoms and I don't do rat testing, I may be able to go back earlier than if I do do rat testing um, and I still test positive for rats and that, you know, the, those are difficult things to do. In my view, um, for for those of us in healthcare, I do think there is an element of being infectious if you're still testing positive between you know day four and day seven, um, and if you can not come into work um, and work from home during that period or work by yourself in that period, that's good. You need to come into work for some reason. Then coming in and wearing a mask. Uh, I'm, you know, again, we get into this discussion about when you're using a mask for source control, which is where they're really effective, how much better is an N95 than a surgical mask? To me, that difference is for source control, okay, bigger difference if you're trying to protect yourself between masks and respirators. For source control, the difference is smaller, and I would be happy um, uh, with a mask on people in that situation. But again, I think there's a, you know, there, there's there's room for um, different decisions because there's still a lot of uncertainty about it. Thanks, Allison. Uh, a couple of questions came up around Paxlovid and Paxlovid rebound. I'm just wondering, I think, how common it is and does this influence indications for prescriptions? Yeah, so lots of, of uh, uncertainty about exactly how many people get Paxlovid rebound. I, I think it's centering down around the 15 to 20% of people. So not common, but it's also not rare. And the problem when you do get Paxlovid rebound and, and test positive again, that is infectious virus. So you do have to go back to worrying about transmission to other people. But it's also true that what you don't get is severe disease. So you don't need retreatment if you have Paxlovid rebound, but you do have to worry about being infectious to other people. And people do get symptoms back again. Um, it's, it's, it's really frustrating and, uh, and we still don't understand exactly why it happens, right? Extending Paxlovid does not seem to make it better. So it's a, it, it remains a bit of a mystery. Great. Actually, I think that's really helpful um, for those of us that do have those patients that come in that are positive again, knowing that we don't have to prescribe Paxlovid again. Uh, just another question actually around um, patients that have had multiple COVID infections, just wondering if there's any literature on the impact of this, whether there's any long-term effects if they've had more than one infection or maybe many. So I I think the answer is I don't think so, and we don't have data now. So, so we do know that you can get long COVID after, you know, you can get away with not having long COVID after one infection, but get long COVID after your second and third infection. Um, so, so you know, there there is that piece of it. 
Um, but I, we, we don't have as evidence that repeated infections um, cause any long-term harm or any other sort of added complications beyond that ongoing risk. And that, you, you know, that is completely uh, congruent with what we know about viral infections in general, okay? Uh, those of us, you know, who are my age have had multiple infections with RSV and with rhinoviruses and with influenza over the years, and we are still standing, um, and, and there's not evidence of cumulative damage, and we're expecting COVID to be like that, okay? There is nothing at the moment that tells you that, it, you know, the first thing is, yep, we're all going to get reinfected with COVID a lot over the next 70 years, right? Virus is here to stay, um, and there's going to be lots of infections. We're, we're just waiting at the moment to know how mild or severe those infections are going to be, right? We're still at the stage where we're accumulating population immunity, and, and we don't know whether the average person in the population needs to have one infection or two infections or 10 infections before we get to a steady state of how severe those infections are, right? Um, so, uh, but but we're all gonna get repeated infections and, and it's, you know, you look at somebody who's had multiple infections, the most common reason for having multiple infections um, is, you know, being willing to be out there and tolerate a lot of exposure and not worry so much uh, about having those infections. Um, but there's no evidence that 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 accumulation of infections is going to cause damage. Great. Thanks, Alison. A couple of questions just around the COVID vaccine. So um, first of all, someone wondering if you can ever test positive, if the vaccine itself can cause a slightly positive rat. This happened uh, for someone who had a patient, an older patient that uh, had a positive rat a week after the vaccine. And also, um, if someone had COVID in the fall, when you would be recommending that they get their COVID shot? So, as far as we know, you can't test positive um, from, uh, it is true that the COVID vaccines contain spike protein, but the distribution is at low enough concentrations that the, it should not give you a positive rat. So there's a couple of things about positive rats. The first is you can get COVID, you know, a week after you've been vaccinated, and there's a lot of COVID out there. So, you know, if you... The, the only piece of good news about getting COVID shortly after you've been vaccinated is you know it will be less severe than it would have been if you hadn't been vaccinated, okay? So you kind of need to hold on to that when you get it. But so so people can get COVID a week after they get their COVID vaccine, uh, it happens. The second thing always to remember with rapid tests is you can get false positive weak rapid tests. They're not that common, but they do happen. There's always gonna be somebody um, who has it. So, you know, when somebody is asymptomatic, a week after their vaccine, they have a weak positive COVID rat is like, you know, don't know, could be a mild infection, that would be okay, might be a false positive test, can't always distinguish between them. I'm sorry, and you had a second question about vaccines that I lost. Oh, no, it was uh, if someone had had the vaccine in the, if they'd had COVID in the fall when they should get the vaccine. Oh, COVID in the fall. Yeah. So, so remember, standard advice is um, having a dose of COVID vaccine is, in terms of short-term protection, pretty equivalent to having an infection. So if you've had an infection since September, you can rate yourself as having had a COVID vaccine dose. Um, and that buys you, generally speaking, six months. I think the reason I'm hesitating a bit here is you'll notice the ministry sent out a notice a couple of weeks ago saying people in long-term care and people who are really high risk might consider now having only leaving a three-month gap um, just because there's so much COVID about. And, and we know that, you know, short-term protection against less severe disease declines quickly. So it's going to be between three and six months, and it's probably going to be six months. But certainly if you've had COVID in the last two months, it's the same as having had a COVID vaccine and you don't need another dose before the season, you know, the, the holiday season. Great. Thanks, Allison. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, one, people are still sort of wondering about masking. Um, for example, should we be introducing mandatory masking for staff and patients in our primary care practices? Um, all We've all read lots of the guidance, but uh, it's still not entirely clear. Just wondering what your thoughts are on that. So <clears throat> I think I, I, the the new recommendations for PIDAC suggest that we 
sorry, suggest that we should be using masking um, for direct clinical care um, through the winter season. That's not universal masking at all times in the practice, but that is for clinical care. And they also suggest that that should be a minimum. I think that leaves people in the position of making, you know, collaborative decisions within the office practice. There is nothing wrong um, with people with, with more masking um, in practice. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and as activity increases, there may be people who are more comfortable um, in offices working when they're wearing a mask. And so I, to me, the we're, we're probably not at a state where we're recommending universal masking at, you know, at all times in every hospital or in every clinic area. Um, but it may also be that you want to think about, you know, if you have an immune compromised staff member who might be exposed, that might be a reason for making a cooperative decision about wearing more masks. Um, if you have somebody who wishes to wear a mask um, in more places in the office, that's another thing about, you know, respecting people's decisions about what's important. So I think there's, I, I think the new PIDAC recommendations leave you some leeway for more masking, um, but tell you that the, the, the base that we should be maintaining is masking for um, patient care. Thanks, Allison. Uh, it's one last question. I'm not sure what, well, well, I'll send it, pose it to you. And it's the question about where kids less than two can get their COVID vaccines now. I think this has come up as uh, potentially an issue, especially within Toronto. Yeah, and not my, I don't know whether there's somebody who's uh, online. It's a, it, the, there's no question um, that it's an issue, but I don't have a clear no, answer I... to it, Tara. We, we have connected with um, Dr. Dan Wyshevsky at the Chief Medical Officer of Health's office, and you know they're aware of this issue. Um, unfortunately, it is an issue in Toronto um, because uh, you know most pharmacies or no pharmacies are vaccinating kids under two, although some I think say they would on their website. Um, and uh, the public health uh, unit is where kids under two are gen had generally been going but obviously Toronto Public Health has closed down all its vaccine uh, clinics. Um, and so this does leave a gap and they're aware of it. Um, and I think it's something that they're working on. Um, obviously as family doctors, if we are giving the vaccine, that's a place that they can come, but we all know the barriers that it, that um, vaccine vaccinating for COVID have posed for us as family doctors. So yeah, there's no great option other than potentially, you know, driving to a different uh, area of, the province, because I believe the public health units outside of Toronto are continuing to have vaccine clinics and would provide children uh, less than two uh, with a vaccine at that time. But I think we need to continue to advocate for those patients. I think as Allison also mentioned, though, that the focus really is on older adults. Um, and so I think that's the other reason why, um, you know, uh, there hasn't been more action taken earlier. So I think that was the last question for, for Dr. McGeer and um, uh, Allison, before, I know you have to head out early at 8.45, but before you do that, if you're able to just uh, take a look at the most upvoted questions in the quality in the Q question and answer and, and do what you can to answer the remaining ones, that would be great. Um, uh, I um, also wanted to pe remind people of the wonderful um, um, OCFP website. And uh, I'll, I'll just repost that in the chat because some of the questions folks have are about resources and where to find things. And if you go to the Ontario uh, College of Family Physician website, respiratory illness, all of the links that you really need to know to get things for um, treating people with COVID or, or diagnosing COVID are all there in one place. Um, so we're gonna uh, change gears now and I'm gonna introduce, uh, I'll just let you know what's going to happen. We'll, we'll have a short remarks from Maggie Karastachi, then hear briefly from Mahalay Kumanen, and then we're going to go on to our second set of speakers, um, Jonathan Eisenberg and Anna Shirelli. So I'm going to just turn it over to start to, to Maggie, because I know this has been an incredibly tough year, incredibly tough three years. And, you know, as we close out the year, we wanted to just take a moment to reflect on the wonderful work that all of you do and make sure that you know that you are appreciated. Um, Maggie. Thank you so much, Tara. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be with you today and to share some of my reflections about primary care and just how very important you are um, and important, how important you've been to myself as well as other patients and caregivers. About 18 months ago, I went from being a caregiver 
to being a caregiver and the patient uh, when I developed unusual but significant sick belly from a COVID infection. So what has allowed me to get the care I need, despite the fact that I've been in and out of numerous emergency departments, is that for the first time in a decade, I have a family doctor. I have never been to the doctors as much as I have in the past year and a half. And yet I've never once felt like I'm a bother, even though my experience post COVID presents a conundrum for care that I know is as frustrating for my doctor as it is for me. It's not lost on Ontarians that primary care is in crisis. And it's clear to me how stressful life has been for each of you. I don't know how you do it, but I'm grateful that you do. I know how important a longitudinal relationship with primary care is to patients. And while I'm an N of one um, and my experiences are anecdotal, they reflect what I hear from patients and caregivers that I talk to every day. So let me tell you a really quick story. We live in rural Ontario. So my family doctor also delivers babies and provides care in our local emergency department where he expertly cared for my grandson when he broke his arm. Augie came along with me to one of my appointments several months later, sitting in the waiting room when our doctor came in and he took the time to stop by and chat with the five-year-old. He asked him about his arm and he got a demo right there of his muscles that are much stronger than grandma's. That exchange made Augie stay and he still talks about it. And that's exactly how relationship is nurtured and how trust is built. While primary care clinicians in Ontario continue to deliver on what patients need, we know that you do this within the confines of a system that is not delivering on what's needed to support you. You deliver in spite of the system, not because of it. One lesson that stands out from the pandemic for me is that in order to crisis-proof the system, we need to crisis-proof primary care to strengthen and properly fund your work that forms the foundation of the system. I've watched this primary care community grow over the last couple of years and step up to the plate as advocates for your patients and as advocates for system change. I can't tell you how much I respect you for this. I know advocacy isn't always comfortable and isn't what you train for, but you've done it time and again. Thank you so much. The compassionate advocacy of this network of primary care clinicians has given me hope. Hope because I believe that you've started a movement to transform healthcare in this province that there's no going back from. I know you're tired and frustrated. I beg you to stay and to keep building on what you're doing here because we need you. I'd like to end with a note of personal gratitude. I thank my family doctor and I thank each of you for the care you give to your patients and for the part you're playing in organizing and leading what I think is a necessary transformation of healthcare. You make a difference every single day. Your difference is your ability to care, to form relationship, and as a community, to solve what has looked to be unsolvable to others. I believe the difference you're making will help us to shape a new story about the experiences of patients and caregivers in our health system. I wanna thank you for being the difference that we need. It matters to us as individual patients and it matters to Ontarians who depend on the health system and you every day and into the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie, for sharing, you know, so candidly about your own experience and for offering that note of thanks and a reminder to us about the important impact we have on patients and families and what it means to be a family doctor and the privilege that, that of lives that we hold. You can see all the wonderful messages in the chat that you are um, making people cry. So uh, it, it's a wonderful holiday gift to have that. Thank you from you, Maggie. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mahale uh, Kuminen, who's been leading so much wonderful advocacy work along with the Ontario College to try and ensure that um, you know, our profession is supported and has the tools that we need. So over to you, Mahale. Thanks, Tara. Um, and, and before I jump into my update, I would also just like to take a moment um, to thank all of you for your dedication and the care that you provide and have been providing throughout the past year. Um, I know I feel very, very proud to be a family physician working alongside all of you. And I think like we just heard from Maggie, it is so important for us to remember how we absolutely are um, making a difference in our patients' lives. 
Um, okay, so shifting gears, um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to touch on some of the CPSO resources that we have pulled together at the OCFP. Um, so you, you probably remember we had heard from many of you that there was a lack of role clarity um, between the referrer and the consulting physician that at times ultimately leads to care not happening in the right setting or by the right physician, and that often is taking up more of our time. So in partnership with our colleagues at the SGFP, um, the OCFP had approached the CPSO to gain more clarity on their continuity of care policies. And you will probably remember that earlier this fall, the CPSO released an updated advice to the profession on these policies. So their advice provides greater clarity um, specifically around the administrative responsibilities for specialists, um, including relating to scheduling appointments, ordering tests, and initiating referrals to subspecialists when needed. It also emphasized the importance for clear communication between consultants and family physicians um, in times where we need more clarity. So those are areas like um, allowing greater flexibility on referral forms, um, keeping family doctors informed about the status of referrals or anticipated wait times, and clarifying responsibilities around test management and follow-up care, as well as providing um, comprehensive consult notes to ensure smooth transitions in care. So there, there's a lot of new information or clarifying information. And so what we've done at the OCFP is we've pulled together a toolkit with two resources, um, all available on our website. And I'll just go through these briefly. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the first resource is a summary document um, that we've pulled together that highlights the key updates from the CPSO advice that are relevant to your practice. And we flagged the exact language that's used within the CPSO advice document. So you can see it yourself and don't have to go through the entire document if you don't have time. Um, it also includes links to template letters that I'll touch on in a moment, um, as well as other useful resources from the OMA, um, the Ministry of Health, and uh, the CPSO. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we also created some template letters, and um, these are based on letters that many of you have shared with us that you've been using in your practice. Um, in times where you've had to clarify roles and, and um, send notes back to specialists for um, that clarification. So these templates are intended to be tailored to address the specific issues that you're facing in your practice and can be edited quite easily. Uh, and again, you'll find them on our website. Um, essentially, these allow you to communicate with specialists about the clarifications that have been provided in the CPSO advice document. And the goal really is improving collaboration and um, clarifying roles. Uh, so we hope that these uh, letters are helpful. Um, and you can see on this slide sort of the, the five different categories that they cover. Okay, next slide. And finally, I'll just touch on um, some of the respiratory tools that we have created that are on our website as well. I think Tara had shared the link in the chat. So a number of different things. Um, we have a preparedness checklist for your clinic to help you manage the respiratory surge. Um, we have information on IPAC um, that's been updated to reflect the high risk season. We also have information on vaccines and antivirals, um, as well as a screening tool for respiratory symptoms that your front staff can use. And then um, I've touched on this before, but we do have a number of patient education resources that focus on um, prevention, providing care at home and understanding patient risk. And we do have uh, tip sheets for the general public that we have been sharing on knowing when and where to seek care. And we will continue to share some of these patient facing tools, um, both in social media and in traditional media. Thanks so much, Mahale. Um, this is a great resource for folks. And, uh, you know, and I, and I also just noted, you know, so many people have put into the chat how important it is that we continue to advocate, um, you know, and, and amplify the messages that Dr. McGear shared earlier uh, during the session. And so we're certainly uh, mindful of that. And I think that's all of our, our roles as, as physicians is to try our best to have the voices heard. Um, so with that, we're going to actually uh, uh, turn it over to our next set of speakers. 
Um, so uh, we're going to change topics. And, you know, as part of our evolving COVID community of practice, we are trying to introduce um, new topics uh, to the community of practice, things that we think are um, uh, new, emerging um, changes in policy. And so for this session, we invited folks from the Ontario Breast Screening Program, because as many of you know, there was an announcement about changes to the program that uh, came out in the media a couple of months ago. And I know many patients have questions and you guys have questions. And so really delighted that um, Jonathan Eisenberg and Anna Shirelli from the um, OBSP are here today to give us an update. So over to you, Jonathan. Yes, hello. Thank you for inviting me here today. Hello, everyone. And uh, Dr. Chirelli and I will share updates by the Ontario Breast Screening Program, specifically around the inclusion of people ages 40 to 49 in Ontario's average risk breast screening program planned for the fall. And we also have our clinical lead, I'll just add, uh, Smit, Dr. Samantha Feinberg, who will be helping to answer some of the questions afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. So to jump to the bottom line, Starting fall of 2024, breast cancer screening in Ontario ages 40 to 49 will shift from ad hoc screening accessible via primary care referral to, organize, to an organized screening program accessible by self-referral and primary care referral. That organized screening program is the Ontario Breast Screening Program or OBSP. Next slide, please. So let me contextualize this by explaining what the Ontario Breast Screening Program is. Unless they've had a mastectomy or a past history of breast cancer or breast cancer symptoms, the vast majority of your patients ages 50 to 74 who you refer for mammography get automatically enrolled into this program. Patients in the same age category can self-refer into the program. Organized screening benefits include reminder letters are sent out to ensure people get screened, Results of screening are shared with them. Participants receive navigational support to prevent loss to follow up. The program has quality and performance oversight with key measures of quality that are reported at the regional facility and physician level. So for example, among facilities across the province, one metric that's followed is the time in weeks from abnormal mammogram to diagnosis. And individually, radiologists receive their own quality reports to follow. Next slide, please. So I'd like to zoom out and speak about the breast cancer screening guidelines for people ages 40 to 49 from the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare. And going back 13 years in 2011, the task force did not recommend routinely screening for breast cancer with mammography. However, five years ago, there was a significant change where the task force said, women aged 40 to 49 may wish to be screened based on their values and preferences and in this circumstance, care providers should engage in shared decision-making with women interested in being screened. And despite this Canadian guideline, interestingly, when we look at breast screening in this age group across the country, there is variability in terms of the recommended start age of screening, as well as availability of self-referral versus provider referral across provinces and territories. Next slide, please. So what's happening in Ontario? Currently people ages 40 to 49 at average risk for breast cancer are not eligible for screening within the OBSB. And that means self-referral for screening, a key feature of the OBSB is not available. People must make a personal decision about breast cancer screening in consultation with primary care to get a referral for mammography. And this current state poses a barrier to those who do not have a provider which as we know today is incredibly salient with 2.2 million Ontarians without a family doctor, a number that's expected to grow further as more retire in the coming years. Next slide, please. So the expansion of the OBSP program to people ages 40 to 49 has a three-pronged rationale. Number one, it's going to improve access by making the self-referral option available to all Ontarians aged 40 to 49 thereby removing the significant barrier for those without a primary care provider. Secondly, as we bring this age group into the fold of organized screening, once enrolled, all Ontarians with attached and unattached will receive the benefits I referenced earlier of an organized screening program. And that would be correspondence letters will begin after the first test, 
results will be shared, navigation is provided, and quality oversight will occur. Finally, new modeling data shows a benefit to harms ratio that's more advantageous for this group than past benefit to harm ratios, which my colleague, Dr. Chirelli will explore as she presents additional evidence supporting expansion for ages 40 to 49. But before I do that, I just wanna add that with this expansion, OH will be convening an expert panel to develop a screening policy for people ages 40 to 49 to cover areas such as screening interval, modality, as well as screening prioritization where capacity is limited. So uh, now I'll pass over to you, Anna, the next two slides, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so when we look at the evidence of why would we expand the program uh, to include people 40 to 49, one of the focus was we wanted to improve health equity. So we're so when we look at the data, we do see a slight increase in the breast cancer incidence in females age 40 to 49 in Ontario. This increase has also been seen in the U.S., although it's been a steeper in increase in incidence as well as in Europe. Um, when we look at the, the, you know, when the cancer is diagnosed, the breast cancer, we do find that people uh, less than uh, like 40, 49 or less than 50, they are diagnosed at a later stage. Um, and U.S. data has also found that non-Hispanic Black women are more likely to be diagnosed uh, beyond stage one. And in addition, as we've mentioned, there are people who are, are, who are getting screening mammograms, but it would be outside the Ontario Breast Screening Program. And when we look at there, there are inequities in who gets a mammography screening in Ontario. So when we looked at that data and we compared females who uh, did not have a mammogram, um, who were 40 to 49, we, in terms of where they resided, we found that they were in the most materially deprived communities, in the lowest income neighborhoods, and in the most ethnically concentrated communities. Next slide. In addition, when we look at the um, evidence, we also there's also been quite an improvement in screening technology. So most of the random, there have been no new randomized controls. And most of the randomized controls really uh, included screen film mammography. And we've moved really to digital mammography. So um, the US Preventive Service Task Force in their recent, um, um, I guess, recommendation, they have a draft recommendation that's out. They did a modeling um, exercise. And in this, they looked at, um, they took a pop, if you take a population of a thousand people and you, you they, had, they used different screening scenarios and you started them at age 40 versus age 50 um, to determine um, what would be the benefits and harms. And I just, I pulled out this, in, this data, but there's, of course, they did, they did various different uh, modeling scenarios. But if we look at uh, ages 50 to 74, the target population we currently screen uh, using uh, digital mammography versus no screening, you would find seven breast cancer deaths averted per thousand female persons screened. And then if you started the age, we started at age 40 to 74, it would be about one to two more breast cancer deaths would be averted over a lifetime. So of course, um, with screening, um, even though there are benefits or sometimes harms, which you have to look at as well. And this would include for people 40 to 49, when you start at a younger age, you would increase the number of false positives, um, benign uh, breast biopsies, as well as there would be the increase in overdiagnosis. Um, there are limitations to modeling where you have to remember because they, this, this uh, modeling technique, they assume everybody participates and that all cases received uh, prompt evaluation of their abnormal screening results and immediate treatment. But this gives us a guide and would hopefully be helpful in um, informed decision-making. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So, uh, so Ontarians in this age group, they need the opportunity to make informed decision about whether or not screening is right for them. And by fall 2024 in this model here, they can achieve this in one of three ways. They can call Health 811, they can connect with, a primary, with primary care or a prevention navigator to enter a conversation about breast cancer screening, risks, benefits, values, and preferences. And if patients decide yes, then they can refer to the, themselves to the, into the OBSB. Next slide, please. Oops. And Ontario Health, one more before we say thank you, thank you. And Ontario Health will support primary care providers on this initiative. They know you'll have to field more questions from patients about screening and support conversations for this age group. They're not available yet, but they'll be providing you with new informational tools around breast screening. There'll be FAQs published and website updates that you can access. 
In advance of the rollout, there'll be pre-launch presentations. Meanwhile, fact sheets will be made for public use in different languages. Finally, when needed, participants may also contact Health 811 and prevention navigators where they're available. And so that concludes our very brief updates on the changes planned this fall. And thank you very much to the organizers. Thanks, Jonathan and uh, Anna. And I know Samantha Feinberg is there uh, listening as well and, and ready to answer some questions in the chat if they come up. Um, so I just wanted to summarize kind of what I myself learned as part of preparing for today. Um, and, and I think this addresses some of the comments and uh, discussion that's happening in the chat. Um, so, you know, this is not a change in guidelines. Um, the guidelines are still those from the Canadian Task Force for Preventive Healthcare, uh, which someone did note are being updated. Um, so the last ones were from 2018, but I believe they are being updated. Um, and there's also recommendations from Choosing Wisely and other organizations. And they recommend informed decision-making um, with uh, women uh, or with um, uh, women age 40 to 49. And uh, as to do the informed decision making, I think there are tools on the Canadian Task Force site, including the Thousand Persons tool. Um, hopefully, those will be updated as well. Um, but you know, there were inequities in being able to actually access mammography if you were a woman in that age category and actually wanted mammography, um, uh, and you didn't have a family doctor, you weren't able to. Um, so, you know, part of the reason for this change is that now people who don't have a family doctor are able to self-refer and get screened. Um, people from um, more marginalized communities are better able to access screening as well. Um, and then, of course, people will have the benefit of the organized program if screening is something that they choose. But it's not a blanket recommendation that everybody 40 to 49 should be screened. Um, so that's just a bit of a summary and, and happy for folks to continue to put their questions um, into the Q&A or even the chat um, as we get into this later half of, uh, or the, you know, the last part of our, our talk. Um, there are some questions that had been in, uh, in the Q&A, you know, even early on, and I'm going to start by posing some of those to you, um, Jonathan and Anna, and, um, you know, if your colleague, Dr. Feinberg, Samantha wanted to put, uh, answer them in the chat, that's great too. But one of the questions really related to automated breast ultrasound, um, uh, and the person uh, who put the question said, it, can it help to detect breast cancer in dense breasts? Is it a good test? Are we missing detection by not doing this in addition to the yearly mammogram? So I guess I can answer that question. So um, the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee uh, uh, did a uh, systematic review, which I believe is posted and perhaps we can link that at some time. And they looked at um, uh, supplementary screening for people with dense breasts using MRI and ultrasound as well. So there is, there is evidence um, that there is a, you know, a increase in detection, but of course, with that comes increase in false positives, et cetera. So um, I believe um, their recommendation um, was that there should be supplementary screening, and, and now we're developing guidance as to um, what, what modality would be recommended, et cetera, so in the OBSP. Thanks, and so related to that question, I yeah. think um, Jer Jordana Sachs asked, you know, women age 40 to 50 have more dense breasts. Will these women likely need annual mammography plus ultrasound? So again, that's a very good question. And, and I think uh, Jonathan did mention that um, we are putting together an expert panel. So we would have recommendations uh, for those 40 to 49. And that would include, of course, people with dense breasts. And then, yeah, in terms of, there's certain people identified as increased risk for breast cancer and that category of people would receive annual uh, mammography. So anyone with a family history of breast cancer, personal family history of ovarian cancer, uh, a breast density of BIRADS category D at the time of screening or any documented pathology of high risk lesions. And then finally, any recommendation by the radiologist at the time of screening, all those people would reflexively be, be recalled for a one year mammography. Yeah, that's helpful to know. There's actually relates to another question that came in um, where the attendee says, I'm doing mammograms yearly in all patients, even without dense breast. Isn't that better? 
for early detection um, than every two years. So, so I, yeah, so, um, so if you look at the randomized control evidence, and I think it's also in the Canadian Task Force guidelines, they did look at screening every two years or every year for average risk people. So I guess Jonathan was speaking people who we consider higher than average risk. So for average risk people, it, you know, screening is really effective. It's every two to three years versus every year. That's what randomized control trial evidence shows. And even the US Preventive Service Task Force, they looked at different modeling annual or, or every two years or a hybrid. And again, you know, it's like it's really that benefits to harm ratio. So it's true if you screen people every year, you might find some more cancers, but you do really increase the proportion of false positives, which is a harm, as well as additional bi benign biopsies, et cetera. So the recommendations tend to be for those who are not uh, like those at average risk, which is really the majority of the population, they should be screened every two years. And then there's a, a proportion who are what we consider higher than average risk. If it's their family history or dense breasts would be screened every year. And I guess we're also looking at whether or not that includes supplementary screening. And then there are those who are very high risk, which are currently part of the Ontario High Risk Program who would be screened annually and are screened with an MRI and mammogram. So it's kind of like three groups of screening, but I would not, I would not recommend screening uh, average risk individuals every year with mammography. There, is, there isn't really the evidence for that. Thanks, Anna. I mean, there are actually quite a lot of questions and comments about this, um, women with dense breasts. Um, you know, uh, they say, I see some radiologists recommending offering bilateral screening breast ultrasounds for women with denser breasts, um, but I couldn't find any evidence for this. What's the evidence for MRI use for dense breasts um, or ambiguous um, mammographies and dense, dense breasts? One of our participants has, has put in that they refer people to a specific medical center in Toronto that does do um, ABUS uh, for, for I think $220, um, but that this is covered in some other provinces. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, we probably need an entire session on, on dense breath. So currently, as Jonathan mentioned uh, in the OBSP, if you do have, uh, for people 50 to 74, they're screened every year. If they have, um, that's the recommendation. And as I said, there was, there has been a systematic review by the Ontario Health Technology Assessment Committee where they are recommending supplementary screening, but it's for people who have density. If you look at the BIRADS category, it's density D. Um, so what I guess what we have, so the, the next step would really develop what that guidance is. So you're right, there have been a couple of trials and observational studies which have looked at MRI in addition to mammography and or ultrasound. And again, I guess we're currently now determining um, what the recommendation would be based on this evidence that, that will be coming out. Um, so I guess we're just not there yet. Okay. But it is happening and it, it, you know, it is something we're working on. Yeah. But the good thing is now people will know. Uh, one thing is if you are screening the Ontario Breast Screening Program, um, when you get your result letter, uh, individuals now know what their breast density is. Um, so that's, um, that has been, so breast density notification, I guess, is uh, now part of the OBSP. Great. Um, and so uh, thanks to Samantha Feinberg, who's continuing to answer questions also in the chat uh, and putting some useful information. She summarized, for example, um, the reasons that people might be and uh, ended up being recalled earlier um, that Jonathan wrote orally. She's put them in the chat so you can see them all. Um, and, and, and maybe she'll add something more about dense breasts. Let's see. Um, there are some questions about what age we should stop doing mammography. And I wonder if uh, uh, Jonathan or Anna, you wanted to answer that. I, I can answer that as well. So the evidence really comes from randomized control trials um, and also modeling. And it seems that even with the US Preventive Service Task Force, um, 74 seems to be the age um, that is the most effective. I mean, they looked at, there are some observational studies that go to 79, but in general, they found in terms of, because you have, then you're dealing with other comorbidities, et cetera. So in terms of um, that, that evidence, I guess, randomized control trials and uh, modeling data, 74 uh, seems to be the most effective age. Um, however, in the OBSP with the physician referral, people can continue to be screened. Um, if they speak to their healthcare provider and they would like to be screened, they can have that. Yeah. That's 
And just to add, I mean, the risk of overdiagnosis becomes more salient if, if there's a you know perceived uh, risk of mortality that's higher in this age group. But if you certainly uh, and and that beyond seventy four, they're not captured in the OBSD. But it doesn't mean that as providers we can make an informed decision with our patients as we always have, always can, to decide to continue with mammography, especially if we think our patients have a lifespan more than you know more than eight years. Uh, certainly can proceed with mammography. Thanks. Um, so I also note that, you know, uh, Samantha Feinberg said that, they, that you guys can come back and share more about supplemental screening recommendations once the recommendations are released. Um, and remind, do we have a timeline on when those new recommendations might come out? So the OTAC that was referenced is being released this month. And then we will be convening a panel, an expert panel on how to navigate those recommendations and best implement it on a broader scale. Um, okay, so appreciate that. Um, so I think some of the, uh, so there are also some questions just about logistics. So um, Marilyn Crabtree asks, when will the OBSP build an online booking central intake to support women to book to their location of choice and time with transparent wait times visible? And I think that was something that was echoed as something desirable by many of our participants. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, there were a few logistical things. So that's the first one. Yeah. So currently, yeah, great question. Um, so currently uh, appointments are booked directly at OBSB sites right now. And um, and then the way the booking is done depends on the individual sites. So some of them do have an online booking feature, they may, have, may need to be booked uh, on the phone. And Ontario Health, uh, there's a lot that we do have. One of the things we don't have is a technical infrastructure to support online booking, but they are we are looking into this um, and exploring the development of a centralized booking tool for the OBSP in the future. And then um, currently, and sorry, was that just, was the question just the scope of OBSP or was it also to fit as well? It was to OBSP, yeah, okay. and, and, right. and just and I think so. I think um, it sounds like you know that would be wonderful, and it's great that you guys are looking into it. I think the other suggestion that seems to have come out was also, um, you know, many people mailing uh, reminders. Um, you know, that's a pretty old-fashioned way of communicating with people now. Uh, SMS or email might be more effective. It's also potentially more equitable if people, for example, don't have a, a home or a permanent address. Um, so, uh, just something for you guys to take into consideration. I don't know if you want to speak to whether that's on, uh, in the horizon for you. Yeah, Maybe. absolutely. Yeah. There's a, so there is, it's called the digital correspondence tool. It's a whole initiative where we're looking at exploring, migrating, um, correspondence letters by mail over to a digital forum. Um, yeah, it, it's just in terms of, uh, there's just a lot of planning around that and, and, and testing, uh, before we implement that larger scale, that is that is certainly on our radar and and one of the um, one of the priorities that we're we're looking at. Great, and I guess a question as well. Um, people were wondering, you know, for the people who don't have a family doctor, they were curious who's going to follow up on the abnormal results. So OBSB sites have designated physicians that are able to navigate and follow up uh, the next steps of these abnormal results. Great. Um, so uh, there's a question here about uh, so about 40 to 49 um, screening and that they're still premenopausal. And so should the timing of mammography be addressed in relation to the period, those who are premenopausal and discomfort with the pre procedure, um, does the timing of the mammogram and the menstrual cycle affect the quality of the test or the results? I'm going to defer... I'm going to invite Samantha if you want to post that particular question in case you have insights to that. I mean, I've I have an answer in my mind, but it shouldn't affect quality. Yeah, that was. Um, so we'll see Samantha um, trying to answer that there. I think um, she's also answered some other questions about density. Breast density should be routinely reported. Any with, with BIRAD D, breast density should be called back yearly for screening. So uh, just um, those were some of the things that Samantha's put in. Um, Samantha's also said it shouldn't affect quality in terms of the men's timing of the menstrual cycle, but if someone knows they are uncomfortable, they can try to book when they are less symptomatic. 
So this has been super educational. I think it's actually corrected some misconceptions out there because um, even like myself, I thought that the guidelines it was changing, but it's not the guidelines. It's actually just that people can enter a formal screening program if they make an informed decision about breast cancer screening. Um, I wanted to ask our audience um, a little bit about what other topics you might want to see us um, put forward in the community of practice, because we're always trying to bring you the latest in, uh, in, 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 um, uh, to help you with your clinical practice. I'm wondering, Pavitra, if you could, or Julia, if you could post the poll that we have. Um, these are some of the topics that we've been considering, and you can check all that apply, I believe. So just um, check any of these that would interest you, whether that's um, a session on obesity, a session on hormone replacement therapy and menopause, diagnosing adult HD, ADHD, new lipid, osteoporosis, alcohol guidelines, um, or maybe none of these. And if you have other suggestions and want to put them into the chat, we would welcome that. Um, so, and of, of course, please do fill out your evaluation at the end to give us even more detailed feedback. Um, Jonathan and Anna, you've done a great job, like just uh, providing us with some really up-to-date information. And also thank you for um, answering so many questions. Maybe if you could just in the last uh, couple of minutes, just take a look at the Q&A and see if there's any others that uh, we haven't gotten to and you could answer, that would be great. I'm gonna ask um, uh, Julia, if you could put up the slides while people are still answering that poll question. And we'll just uh, go through some of the reminders for folks uh, just at the end of our session, sharing some resources. Great. Um, so, uh, and then Julia, let me let me know when when there's a good response rate to our poll. Um, so, uh, just to say that uh, draw people's attention to a new choosing wisely resource. Um, the pediatric viral prescription, as well as a bronchiolitis guidance. And so uh, I think this is something that could be a really practical tool for our patients. Um, uh, so check out the Choosing Wisely website for the new tool on bronchiolitis, on bronchitis, sorry, as well as um, the patient facing tools, including this pediatric viral prescription. Next slide. Um, just a reminder that you can sign up to be a Sentinel practitioner. So Dr. McGeer reminded us that it's really hard to tell uh, what kind of virus people have. If you really want to know, you can become a Sentinel practitioner and help our system actually keep track of, of uh, how things are going from a virus perspective. But um, also, um, it's sometimes helpful and interesting for you in a clinical practice setting. So there's information there. Next slide. Um, just a reminder that for those who are testing positive for COVID, you can um, access Paxlovid uh, through this randomized trial while still contributing to evidence around for whom it is useful. Um, and so we'll continue to circulate the information about can treat COVID where they can access a pharmacist uh, and have medications delivered to their home. Very little work for any family doctor and patients can self-refer. Next slide. Um, and then, of course, uh, Family Medicine Summit's coming up in January, so hopefully you guys will have registered soon. And next slide. Uh, so that's our last slide. And I wonder, Julia, can you um, share the results of our poll just so we can see what it is that topics? So it looks like we're on track here with most people saying the topics we've picked are ones that are interesting to them. Um, people are particularly interested, yeah, in, in topics related to menopause, osteoporosis, and obesity. Um, so yeah, we're stay tuned for some of that um, upcoming. And uh, we love to get your suggestions to try and make these sessions as relevant as possible. So just a reminder that we'll be back in about a month's time, January 19th. Um, we're practically probably going to have a bit of a focus on pe pediatric respiratory illness during that session. Um, and uh, I wanted to give a big thank you to our panelists today, Dr. Allison McGeer, Jonathan Eisenberg, um, uh, Anna Shirelli, as well as uh, uh, on the chat, Samantha Feinberg, and uh, the wonderful thank you that we had from Maggie Karastechi. Uh, just a, you know, a wonderful reminder of the wonderful work that all of you continue to do on a daily basis for your patients. And as we go into the holidays, I hope that you can um, hold on to that message of gratitude on behalf of all of your patients and the healthcare system, because without the work that you guys do, um, people would not, people, you know, things would be falling apart uh, and people would be left in the lurch. 
And so you guys are the glue that hold the system together and uh, you know that and, and we know that. Um, and we are the people who are caring for people um, who uh, over time in a way that others really you know, are often not able to see. So uh, thank you for all that you do. I hope that all of you get some rest over the holiday season and we'll see you back in January. Take care.